Hello and welcome to In The Mess. Today we're going to be talking about your first day in haematology and we've got friend of the podcast Abby who's a haematology registrar joining us. This will also be going out as a podcast so find us in the usual podcast places or on YouTube. So Abby, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Abby. Uh, thanks for having me on, on the podcast, Sophie. I'm one of the haematology registrars working in the north of Scotland and I'm currently an SD4. Lovely to have you, Abby. So why don't you give us a bit of an introduction to the patients that you look after in the haematology ward? Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we, we can think about it as, as both inpatient and outpatient because most of our patients who come to our ward uh, have complications related to the treatment we've given them. So majority of our patients are outpatient based so we, we do a lot of clinics in general hematology which includes managing patients with complex anemias sickle cell disease um, hemostasis and thrombosis clinics where we manage patients with recurrent vtes and, and managing risk stratification to decide long-term anticoagulation and then our malignant clinic which is the bulk of our workload the inpatients are predominantly patients with malignant diseases uh, including lymphomas leukemias and myeloma and are usually admitted because of emergency presentations related to their conditions or because of the chemotherapy we've given them. What sort of things do you often get referred to the wards and what sort of things are you wanting to look after? Because obviously you're not going to take every patient with an abnormal haematology result on their bloods. No, there's often a lot of red on the, on the blood results and, and people panic when they see that. The, the patients we admit to our ward are, are usually the ones we found ourselves in a way that the, the laboratory will flag up an abnormal blood result, which we will look at under microscope and usually get a diagnosis. So often we will know the result and the diagnosis before the parent team does because the laboratory staff will have already made a blood film for us to look at and we will have made a diagnosis of acute leukemia and the patients get directly admitted to our ward. Um, we do not usually take patients with anemias related to B12 deficiency, folate deficiency or, or iron deficiency. Uh, Hematology should not be getting referrals for iron deficiency because this is predominantly a GI or a, or a gynecology problem. Good to know. Um, what are the top three conditions that you would expect your junior doctors to be able to manage on the ward or at least start management for? Yeah, uh, this is a good one because hematology can seem very daunting and, and some some of our acronyms get overly overly complicated our chop can become our codox mr ivac which gets overly over overly complicated and we're not expecting any of our junior doctors working on the wards to be comfortable with any of these chemotherapy regimens we do however expect them to be able to be safe practitioners and the main condition that they will expect to see on the ward will be neutropenic sepsis uh, and that is as a complicant cop that is as a complication of the various regimens we use to treat their underlying hematological malignancies. The expectation would be to do a safe ABCDE assessment, promptly assess the patient and administer the antibiotics within one hour of presentation. Um, unlike most other wards, you will not be criticized for using broad spectrum antibiotics in hematology. We Our initial antibiotic of choice or combination of antibiotics choices would be piperacillin, tazobactam and gentamicin and if the patient is unwell meropenem along with an antifungal agent. Is there a reason that you're able to use such broad spectrum groups of antibiotics together? Yeah and from from outside it can seem that we're being um, not cautious or not rational with our antibiotic choices but evidence has shown over time that despite ways to prevent infection in patients with hematological malignancies for example we use ciprofloxacin routinely in neutropenic patients to prevent them getting infections when they do become septic uh, the types of bacteria that they become septic with require broad spectrum antibiotics so tazacin and gentamicin cover the gram positives and the gram negative bacteria respe respectively Meropenem has been evidence-based to treat E. coli bacteremia and as the, one of the biggest causes of admission to the intensive care unit for our patient cohort and one of the biggest reasons that these patients do poorly. So escal early escalation to meropenem is considered life-saving in these patients. 
And you would still want to do a lot of the usual things like taking cultures and trying to do appropriate investigations to find the source of the infection. Absolutely. And I think you're heading towards sepsis six there, take three, give three or however you remember it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the only caveat that's slightly different would be the blood cultures. We, If our patients have lines, we, we want cultures or we routinely take cultures from all their ports along with paired peripheral cultures to try and work out if it if their infection is coming from their line, that might be a PIC line or a Hickman line. Uh, any other conditions that your junior doctors should be able to routinely manage? Yeah, I mean, the inpatient setting, we prescribe a lot of blood and blood products. So transfusion reactions are fairly common on our ward. On an average day, we prescribe five or six patients blood products. So being comfortable with recognizing and treating transfusion reactions um, is important on a haematology ward and the, the rule of thumb is if you're not sure ask for senior help early and, and stop the transfusion. Um, there are standard guidelines available as well in, in most hospitals and, and through the blood transfusion handbook which is freely available in terms of how to manage how to manage these reactions. I think there's also a new package of e-learning on Turas isn't there? There's always always packages of e-learning to do yes but I think that's now Scottish wide by the uh, by the Scottish Blood Bank uh, to formalise training at, at various different time points. Might be something useful to read up on before starting in the in the ward. Yeah, um, or, or even just looking at um, like an algorithm uh, rather than going through all the modules, which can can be quite time consuming. But yeah, yeah, I think it's part of mandatory training that you have to do it now. So mm -hmm. it's no getting away. And any anything else that your junior doctor yeah. should be familiar with? The final condition, I think, that would be useful to, to be aware of is tumor lysis syndrome. Again, this is a complication from the treatment we give patients. Patients with lymphoma with bulk, and, and, and the definition of bulk varies depending on the subtype of lymphoma, and leukemia with a very high white cell count. Um, the, these conditions are rapidly treated with steroids and chemotherapy. And when that happens, the cells break down and they release their inter intracellular products, including potassium, phosphate and the phosphate then depletes the uh, calcium so the, the typical abnormalities include hyperkalemia hyperphosphatemia hypocalcemia and a hyperuricemia all products from inside the cell the main consequence of this is um, acute kidney injury to the point of some patients requiring dialysis uh, and arrhythmias and seizures so we as, as registrars uh, and consultants looking after these patients, we risk stratify these patients using standard performers. But in terms of what the, what we'd expect the, the the team on the ward to do is to be able to take the blood test at the right time point and in and, and do the appropriate uh, measures for the blood test. So, for example, one of the drugs we use to prevent tumor lysis syndrome is raspuricase, which is a recombinant enzyme that breaks down uric acid. Um, Sounds like Charles could do that. Charles could do with it. Anyway, uh, is, <laughs> um, this is a drug that breaks down uric acid. But if you take a blood sample from the patient and do not put the sample on ice, the, and while, it, while it's being transited to the lab, the, the sample will continue to, to have a undetectable uric acid. So therefore it's uninterpretable. We'd expect them to take a sample on ice and deliver it to the lab at that point so the uric acid can be appropriately interpreted. Um, we will usually advise on the right time points to do the blood tests, but the other, other means of managing this is to hydrate the patients aggressively with intravenous fluids. So for FI1 starting on your ward in the next couple of weeks, um, what sort of things could they expect to be doing day to day on the ward? I think Hematology is a really good place to start as an FY1, and although it might seem daunting, um, I, I would advise all of you listening just to just to relax. There's always going to be a senior support or a senior registrar around to help you. Uh, I think there's one difference between surgical and medical wards, and that there's always going to be a medical registrar on site on the ward to to, to support you. Um, on a day to day basis, we did we well I I. I, I my FI1s in my ward at the moment usually help with clerking in elective patients coming in for procedures or for their elective chemotherapy um, and helping with ward jobs, predominantly taking blood tests from our patients, which uh, in, in includes taking blood from a PIC line. Many units across Scotland have now moved to nurse-led uh, 
blood drawing through pick lines, but some units still require medical staff to do this. So we will be expected to show you how to take blood from a pick line in a sterile fashion, cleaning the uh, cleaning the ports and making sure that it doesn't get infected because these are central lines with, with big risk of infection if not handled carefully. I think that's a really useful skill to be able to do. Yeah. What sort of procedures do you think the junior doctors would be able to observe on the haematology ward? Um, well, I'm hoping not only will they observe, but actually do some of the procedures. So the two main procedures we do are lumbar punctures and bone marrow biopsies. Uh, the lumbar punctures are given uh, are done not only for diagnostic reasons but also to administer chemotherapy while fy1s or or any other junior doctor would not be on the intrathecal register and therefore can't administer the chemotherapy there be more than welcome and and, and would enjoy uh, learning to do the lumbar puncture procedure under supervision uh, some of our other trainees in the past have learned to do bone marrow biopsies independently which is a great skill and uh, quite fun to do because we spread the slides at the bedside and then you can take those slides get them stained up and look at the sample under a microscope which is the main reason i actually got into hematology myself to make a diagnosis from a blood film and a bone marrow aspirate yeah there's nothing quite like seeing it in front of your own eyes is there well for some people <laughs> um speaking about that um what should people do if they're interested in pursuing a career in hematology is a, is a good question and i think there's lots of things they can be doing um getting involved in projects such as audits and quality improvement projects in the department while they're rotating through, um, trying to get some papers written up with, with registrars or, or consultants. Um, another useful thing I, I'd recommend is actually shadowing a registrar. That's what got me to, to, to want to do hematology. I think using a taster week would be a good idea for this where you can shadow uh, and, and, and see what the registrars do, particularly in the laboratory side of things where actually, uh, looking at the cells under microscope and making that diagnosis and looking at the subtleties of the morphology uh, is is really inspiring okay and lastly do you have any words of wisdom or bugbears that you'd like to share with us um well uh, it, it, not not really bugbears but a top tip for hematology for for any patient you, if you're clarking in a hematology patient it's simple there's only three blood cells uh, so if you're taking a history, just focus on those three blood cells. Red blood cell symptoms are anemic symptoms, so tired, etc. Uh, platelets, uh, make sure you ask a good thorough bleeding history. Uh, make sure they're not on anticoagulants and antiplatelets, and if they are bleeding, stop them in our patients. Um, and the white blood cells, so recurrent infections. Thanks, Abby. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us no, today. It's been really great to hear from you. Hopefully you guys found that useful. Leave your comments and questions below and let us know if there's any other specialties you'd like us to do a first day in for. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss a thing.